From New York, the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States, this is Democracy Now! We're very proud of the product. We think it is, uh, uh, we did jujitsu on it, that it went from a corporate first uh, proposal that the Republicans put forth in the Senate uh, to a workers first, uh, Democratic workers first legislation. The U.S. becomes number one in the world for coronavirus infection as it surpasses China and Italy. Congress is voting on a $2 trillion emergency relief package to address the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. A record-shattering nearly 3.3 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits. So we're not getting paid, and I'm the uh, primary wage earner in my home. And so, um, you know, I went ahead and filed for unemployment, and... We're just going to ride this out like everybody else, I guess. We'll get response from Minneapolis Congress member Ilhan Omar, one of the first two Muslim women elected to Congress and the only African refugee. We'll speak also with author Matt Stoller, who argues the coronavirus relief bill could turn into a corporate coup if we aren't careful. Then, shelter in place? What happens when you're trapped with your abuser? We'll look at domestic violence during the pandemic with the head of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United States of America has become the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic, overtaking China to lead the world in cases of COVID-19. The virus continued its exponential growth Thursday, surging to over 85,000 U.S. cases, though the true number is certain to be far higher. Over 1,300 people across the U.S. have died from the virus, and the death rate is predicted to accelerate in the days ahead. This is President Trump continues to defy his scientific advisors and downplay the threat of the pandemic. Here in New York City, the largest hotspot of the U.S. crisis, 84 COVID-19 patients died just Thursday as wave after wave of critically ill people flooded intensive care units and threatened to overwhelm the health care system. Columbia and New York University medical schools have said they'll allow medical students to graduate early to join the fight against COVID-19, as hospitalizations surged by 40 percent Thursday. With intensive care beds and life-saving ventilators increasingly in short supply, Mayor Bill de Blasio pleaded for federal authorities to ship an additional 15,000 of the life-saving devices, half of the 30,000, he says, are needed to keep critically ill patients breathing. If you have a ventilator, you can save a life, you can keep someone going, uh, get them through uh, this crisis so they can recover. If you don't have a ventilator, people die who didn't need to die. Some New York City hospitals have begun splitting ventilators to allow two patients to use a single ventilator, as nurses fear a looming shortage will soon force them to decide who lives and who dies. New York officials are pleading with the White House to use the Defense Production Act to order companies to manufacture ventilators and other critically needed medical equipment. But President Trump has refused, saying business leaders have promised to meet the challenge without government intervention. The New York Times reports the White House canceled an agreement with General Motors and Ventec Life Systems to produce up to 80,000 desperately needed ventilators over concerns about the project's one billion-dollar price tag, or about 0.05 percent of the cost of the coronavirus relief bill. On Thursday, President Trump said he doubled New York's urgent request for 30,000. He um, uh, doubted—this is what President Trump said—that he doubted the request. I don't believe you need 40,000 or 30,000 ventilators. You know, you go into major hospitals sometimes, they'll have two ventilators. And now, all of a sudden, they're saying, can we order 30,000 ventilators? That was President Trump. 
Politico reports the White House failed to follow hundreds of pandemic response guidelines laid out in a 69-page National Security Council playbook, squandering more than two months when the federal government should have mobilized to test for new infections while procuring life-saving medical equipment. And ProPublica has published internal emails detailing how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention underestimated the threat of the virus and stumbled in communicating policy to local public health officials. Elsewhere, Louisiana's spike in coronavirus cases measured at the highest rate in the world, with Governor John Bell Edwards calling on students and retired medical workers to volunteer. Louisiana now has over 2,300 confirmed cases. Detroit has emerged as another hotspot, with about 1,400 reported cases in Michigan's Wayne County. Chicago has seen a surge, too, with more than 1,400 confirmed COVID-19 cases in Cook County. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot has closed Lakefront Trail and the Riverwalk after crowds of people defied a stay-at-home order. The House of Representatives is voting today on a $2.2 trillion emergency relief bill to address the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. The bill will generate payments to most Americans and includes protections for workers, but it's also a massive bailout for a number of industries and corporations. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the measure would receive strong bipartisan support, but not unanimous consent, as it did in the Senate earlier this week. Republican Congress member Thomas Massey of Kentucky is considering a procedural move that could delay passage to the weekend. This vote comes as a record shattering. Nearly 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week as the coronavirus crisis idled huge sections of the U.S. economy. After headlines, we'll get an update on the relief bill from Congress member Ilhan Omar and Matt Stoller, who argues the coronavirus relief bill could turn into a corporate coup if if we aren't careful. In immigration news, three unaccompanied immigrant children have tested positive for COVID-19 as they remain in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement in New York. Five staff members and one staff contractor at three separate facilities in New York also recently tested positive for the coronavirus. Still, the agency says it will continue to hold separated children in its custody until quarantines at ORR facilities are lifted. This comes as a 52-year-old Guatemalan immigrant held at the Essex County Correctional Facility in Newark, New Jersey, has tested positive. In Louisiana, asylum seekers held at the Richwood Detention Center have been on hunger strike for at least four days, demanding their release as they fear contracting the virus. In Georgia, at least 350 immigrants detained at the for-profit Stewart Detention Center, known for its chronic medical neglect, also held a hunger strike, demanding their immediate release. In audio recordings, detained immigrants describe cramped conditions, poor planning and increasing panic among prisoners. We are frustrated because of the uncertainty, because we don't know in which moment we can be infected with this virus by people who are coming in here from the outside. We could be infected at any moment, when we go outside, when we go to the yard, when we go eat. We are constantly at risk of infection. So this hunger strike is to demand ICE that, out of humanity, give us our freedom. This comes as public health experts, elected officials and advocacy groups are calling on New York Governor Cuomo to immediately grant clemency to vulnerable, incarcerated people, including the sick and the elderly. This is prisoner rights activist Laura Whitehearn. Everyone who has any power at this moment, the governor has the most power. He could solve this issue immediately through his clemency powers. He has no limit on whom he can release from That's prison. That's Laura Whitehorn. Italy recorded another 662 coronavirus deaths Thursday, bringing its death toll to more than 8,200, more than double the toll in China, where the pandemic began. Some Italian patients have been transferred to Germany due to critical shortages of ventilators and supplies. Spain recorded its deadliest day yet, with 769 COVID-19 deaths in the past 24 hours. In Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced in a video posted on Twitter today 
that he is positive for COVID-19 and will work from home in self-isolation. And Ireland will nationalize its entire health care system for the duration of the pandemic. This is Irish Health Minister Simon Harris. Patients with this virus will be treated for free, and they'll be treated as part of a single national hospital service. As the Taoiseach outlined, today I received government approval that for the duration of this crisis, the state will take control of all private hospital facilities and manage all of the resources for the common benefit of all of our people. There can be no room for public versus private when it comes to pandemic. China has announced a ban on almost all foreigners entering the country in an effort to prevent a second wave of coronavirus infections. In Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe refused calls to look down to lockdown cities, citing the severe economic consequences of a stay-at-home order. Bars, restaurants and shops in crowded Tokyo remain open despite a spike in new cases there. Officially, Japan has over 1,400 confirmed cases, but the true number is certain to be far higher. In northern Syria, civil defense workers known as the White Helmets have pivoted from responding to government bomb attacks to sanitizing camps for internally displaced people. The head of the opposition-controlled Idlib Health Directorate warns more than 100,000 people could die if the coronavirus sweeps through Syria's crowded camps, which lack even basic medical infrastructure. This is Ali Halak, who fled Aleppo for a camp near the Turkish border. As you have seen the situation in the camps, we are afraid of corona. These tents are not able to protect us from the virus, and we are not able to sanitize the tents. In Africa, Ethiopia's president has released over 4,000 prisoners in an effort to prevent overcrowding in prisons and contain the spread of the coronavirus. This comes as Ethiopians are calling on their government to lift months-long Internet shutdowns in parts of Ethiopia, where government forces have clashed with the Oromo separatist group. The blackout has left millions unable to access information about the pandemic. In South Africa, which began a three-week nationwide lockdown today, two COVID-19 deaths have been reported among the more than 900 confirmed cases. Meanwhile, Egyptian authorities have expelled Guardian journalist Ruth Michelson after she reported Egypt has far more coronavirus cases than have been officially reported. In Latin America, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has exempted churches from coronavirus-related lockdowns by classifying religious gatherings as essential services, agreeing to demands from evangelical leaders. Confirmed coronavirus cases in Brazil have skyrocketed in the past week to nearly 3,000. In Mexico, the governor of the state of Puebla is facing backlash after claiming poor people are immune to COVID-19. Meanwhile, the Mexican government has temporarily suspended asylum requests as Mexico attempts to promote social distancing and cancels non-essential services. Mexico has confirmed nearly 600 COVID-19 cases amidst a severe shortage of tests. Back in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency Thursday announced a sweeping and indefinite suspension of environmental rules, telling companies they'll be effectively allowed to regulate themselves during the coronavirus pandemic. Under the new rules, big polluters will no longer be punished for failing to comply with reporting rules and other requirements. Cynthia Giles, the EPA's former head of enforcement under President Obama, told The Hill newspaper the move, quote, tells companies across the country they will not face enforcement even if they emit unlawful air and water pollution in violation of environmental laws, so long as they claim that those failures are in some way caused by the virus pandemic. And it allows them an out on monitoring, too, so we may never know how bad the violating pollution was, she said. In climate news, extreme ocean temperatures along Australia's Great Barrier Reef have sparked the third major coral bleaching event in the last five years. A recent study by University of Hawaii researchers predicts pollution and climate change will destroy 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs worldwide over the next two decades. 
In a blow to civil rights, the Supreme Court issued a unanimous ruling Monday that will make it harder for people to sue over racial discrimination in employment and contract negotiations. The Supreme Court threw out a lower court's ruling that had given the green light for a $20 billion racial bias lawsuit against Comcast, accusing the TV company of discriminating against black-owned channels by refusing to carry their content. The Trump administration's indicted Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro on charges of narco-terrorism and international cocaine trafficking. Attorney General Bill Barr laid out the charges Thursday, claiming Maduro's Socialist United of Venezuela party partnered with dissident factions of Colombia's FARC rebel movement to, quote, flood the United States with cocaine while using the drug trade as a weapon against America. The State Department's offered a $15 million reward for information that could lead to Maduro's arrest. In a nationwide address Thursday, Venezuelan President Maduro dismissed the charges as another attempt by Washington to stage a coup d'etat. Maduro blasted President Trump as a racist cowboy and fired back at the United States state's handling of the coronavirus crisis. The United States has become a public health threat to the public health of Latin America, the Caribbean and the world. There is no public health system in the United States. There is no public health system. The entire system is private. And 30-year-old Indian-American journalist Lina Anwar has died after a long battle with an aggressive form of leukemia. Her struggle for what might have been a life-saving stem cell transplant exposed racial disparities in the National Bone Marrow Registry and inspired a nationwide campaign urging people of South Asian descent to become stem cell donors. To see our coverage of Lina's struggle, go to democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the epicenter of of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. We're broadcasting from New York City. The United States is now number one in the world for coronavirus infections, overtaking China and Italy. The number of cases in the U.S. has surged to 85,000 people. The number is far higher because of the lack of testing. As President Trump continues to defy his scientific advisers and downplay the threat of the highly contagious disease, at least 1,300 people have died across the U.S., and the global death toll is more than 24,000. As much of the United States and the world is under lockdown, the House of Representatives is voting today on a $2 trillion emergency relief package to address the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. The bill will generate payments to most Americans and includes protections for workers, but it's also a massive bailout for a number of corporations and industries. The vote comes as a record-shattering nearly 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits benefits last week amidst the coronavirus crisis. This is optician Ali Nelson, who was laid off amidst the pandemic. We stayed open as long as we could until, you know, it just got to be too much. And uh, our, uh, our bosses pretty much said, you know, we're going to have to shut down um, until further notice. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. So uh, not uh, fortunately, it's a small company, so we're not getting paid. And I'm the uh, primary wage earner in my home. And so, um, you know, I went ahead and filed for unemployment. For more, we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Congressmember Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. She's the first Somali-American elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, one of the first Muslim women in Congress, along with Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. And she's the only refugee, a refugee from Africa. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Congressmember Omar. Um, can you talk today about what you are voting on? Can you talk about this massive, the largest bill, relief bill in the history of the United States. What concerns you most? Why are you supporting it? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Amy, for um, having me. Uh, I was just listening to, to you go through the, the story and uh, being the epicenter of this pandemic truly is the wrong kind of American exceptionalism. We would like to be on top of every list. This is the one list we should never really aspire to be on. And um, I think this crisis uh, and this pandemic really lays bare the kind of inequalities uh, 
that have existed for far too long in, in our country. Uh, and the conversations we're having right now as we put forth our, our third uh, relief package uh, shows us that there is uh, often a prioritization of corporate interests uh, and often not a prioritization of the interest of the people. So today I plan on voting for this bill, not because it's perfect or um, it's uh, sufficient, but because I think in a, in a time where we are facing one of the largest crises we've faced in, in our country, it's going to be really important for us to do everything that we can to protect the lives and the livelihoods of, of the people of, of this country. Uh, my home state, just in one in 10 days, uh, there has been 165,000 um, people who filed for unemployment insurance. Uh, and nationwide, as you said, it's 3.3 million. And, and so we have to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to deliver relief. So a few of the things that are in this package uh, really align with the progressive vision that we've had and some of the bills that I've introduced uh, as we've gone through this, this crisis. One is that it will offer cash relief. Uh, it's not the kind of universal or monthly cash relief that I'd uh, champion, um, but it will be helpful to uh, a lot of people. We are also seeing an exceptional expansion of unemployment insurance. Um, as you know, that's thanks to uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, who made sure that we had that in there. Uh, for the first time, we saw Republicans get uh, bent out of shape because <laughs> Americans who are poor might be able to get a few extra dollars. Um, even though they are going to be the most in need during this, this crisis. Uh, we're also seeing an expansion of the unemployment insurance where it will cover people who are new, um, who, who have had a new entrance into the job market, people who are self-employed, uh, people who are self-isolating uh, or are forced to isolate. Uh, and so it is going to be a helpful package in, in that regard. We're going to see real relief for small businesses in my district, uh, in the Minnesota 5th, we're seeing uh, a real squeeze um, and, and pain being felt by small businesses. Uh, and so I introduced the ABLE Act, and I believe uh, this package currently allows uh, for the vision that I had um, to, to be actualized. We're also heard, we also heard so much from our local municipalities, big cities, small cities. I represent Minneapolis and uh, 15 uh, suburban cities. And so we know that many of them uh, need the relief that comes, uh, uh, that's coming in this package towards states and local municipalities. There are many governors uh, and mayors around the country, like our governor um, Walls, who are showing exceptional leadership, who are not downplaying uh, this pandemic, who are doing everything that they can to protect the public, uh, provide relief. Minnesota is one of the few states that has put a, a moratorium on eviction. Um, they're working really hard to try to make sure that there is support uh, for people. We also have um, a, a, a sort of a lockdown in place that helps curb the spread of, of this virus. Uh, visions that we have for, for, for the country that are being carried out uh, by the leadership so, in, in Minnesota. So, Congress Member Omar, let me ask you, the bill includes a $1,200 one-time payment to most Americans, with $500 in addition for kids. You have called for um, getting cash in people's hands. It should be universal and monthly. Um, mm -hmm. What how are people going to get this money, even those that get this one-shot deal, uh, people in the gig economy? Uh, how is it delivered to them? Yeah. That, that really is uh, the, the, the one piece um, that this, this bill is very divergent from the vision that I had and, and many others um, had. Uh, we expected uh, that it would 
go through um, the, the IRS and Social Security to make sure everyone would be able to get the, the money that they need. Uh, and now we're hearing that this process is going to go through um, the IRS. It's for people who have filed um, taxes before and people who have uh, accounts um, and had direct deposits. And so it's going to be uh, a very messy uh, process and uh, completely disheartening because we know Americans need this relief today. Uh, and so any administrative delay is going to exasperate the kind of economic anxiety and pain many of our community members are feeling. Your, con your fellow Congress member um, Rashida Tlaib has called for the um, for the government to give out debit cards that people mm -hmm. can have access to money right away. Right, because what you want is you want to make sure that you're making it as accessible as possible, and that you are not spending money on uh, ad administrative costs. And so when we make this, this process means-tested, when we make it uh, a process that goes through so many hoops, we know it's, it's not going to get into the hands of the people that need it the most when they need it the most. And so that's the piece in, in this legislation that's really um, devastating, because we know that the, the corporations that are getting the bailout uh, are not going to have difficulties in extracting the money that they're um, uh, being promised, but the people will. And that really is when you get to see how unjust our systems uh, can be and how cruel uh, it is to be poor uh, and and disconnected and, and resourceless uh, in this country. You and Congress member Ayanna Presley um, have uh, introduced legislation to cancel student debt as part of the COVID-19 emergency stimulus package. Um, was that included in the bill? Explain. So what we were calling for was a $30,000 cancellation of student debt. Uh, the bill currently does not have that. It has about Ten thousand um, dollars. Again, it is. It's not as as clean as uh, it would have been with Ayana and I's bill. Um, and it, it again will have a, a huge process. The one thing that I am exceptionally excited about is the fact that there is uh, a deferment uh, for um, student debt, so that people can get relief for a few months in, in regards to that. What about undocumented immigrants, the millions of millions and millions of people who are afraid to come forward, perhaps even to get tested, which is not only protection for them, but for the whole community? When President Trump was asked about this, whether they would be gone after if they went to a hospital or if they got a test, he said, no, they can certainly do that. It's important, uh, he suggested, before they're deported to another country. Your response? So we, we know that there are many people who are still being subjected to ICE raids, who are being put in ICE detention. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, um, one, of my, one of my sisters in service, uh, was at, at an airport uh, due to a tip. Uh, where she stopped young children that were being trafficked by an ICE agent um, transported from one state to, to another. It, and it is really inhumane um, to, to see us continue in this price process. ICE detention centers are overly crowded. So we've called for a halt in deportation. We've called for um, a halt in in all immigration uh, court proceedings because we know that that could be a, a hot spot uh, for the spread of the virus. We've called for a uh, stop in uh, in having ICE come into our communities and, and terrorize people. We want people to feel comfortable enough uh, to seek medical attention when they need it. The reason sanctuary cities exist is because it allows those that are most vulnerable in our communities to be able to access the services that they need. When you have vulnerable communities hiding 
uh, not seeking the, the service that they need, you put all of us at risk. And so we want people to lead with humanity. We want for there to be a just society. And so when we're asking for clemency for those that are ill, um, that are elderly in our in, um, in our jails and prisons, we're asking for people to to be saved who who need to be saved. And so it is really uh, devastating to know that the party of life. Uh, really devalues um, human life uh, regards to, to class or ethnicity Con or gender. Con uh, and that, I think, is, is, is the center of, of the conversation. Congressmember um, Omar, we had on the former director of ICE, uh, um, John Sedwig, who is calling for ICE, which has the ultimate authority in this particular case, to release thousands of detainees. Um, how is this being addressed right now? It, it's not. We, we've we put out uh, a letter, my office led uh, a letter to the administration, um, to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, asking them to do precisely what uh, the former director is calling for. We know that there are so many people who are caught up in, in, this, just, in this unjust immigration system. Um, not everybody is the violent murderer that the Republicans uh, talk about. There are so many people who have a right to seek asylum, who have a right to, to come uh, and look for opportunities um, to start anew. And we need to give them that opportunity, uh, and we need to protect their life at the moment. And again, like I said, it's really quite uh, astonishing to see that the party of life uh, does not advocate for Con all human life Congress to be Member uplifted. Omar, you have been very critical of the $500 billion, what some people are calling a corporate slush fund, that it has very little oversight, though it was strengthened somewhat um, in this latest bill. Others said, why wasn't it just sliced out of the $2 trillion package, um, that uh, you have the president saying he'll be the oversight on what corporations are bailed out? Um, how do you feel that there are some now protections and safeguards in this bill that you're voting on today about who gets this? Well, first of all, nobody trusts uh, Trump and his administration to have oversight over anything, uh, let alone um, this kind of corporate welfare. And we know uh, in, in previous bailouts, money has been uh, misused, uh, and it took years to be able to regulate it and make sure that it was going in to the hands of, of the right people. And so there are some protections in, in place, uh, and I look forward to what the follow-ups are going to be as, as we strengthen um, the kind of check and balances that we want to, to put in place. This is when it's going to be really important for uh, Congress to exercise their oversight powers. Uh, to make sure that this independent um, agency that we're going to put in place uh, has the, the 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 right people um, in uh, at the table to be able to to make sure that they are uh, protecting American tax. Congressman Belmar, you are the first African refugee to um, be elected to Congress. You are from Somalia. Uh, Africa has been called a ticking time bomb in the coronavirus uh, pandemic. What needs to happen there? What are your deepest concerns there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really a, a, a privilege when we talk about social distancing, right? I, I recently read an article that was shared by my sister, um, who's currently living in Africa, and she said, you know, in, in Africa, social distancing is just not possible. And so we know that um, they don't have the privileges in, in many spots in, in Africa where they can go and get a week's worth of groceries and have it be refrigerated. Many of Africa uh, doesn't have um, the uh, broadband capacity or internet ca capacity, uh, electricity capacity to be able to work from home for, for a mass population. Uh, and so my hope is that 
there are the efforts that are being put in place by some of the the leaders there um, really do work. Uh, the people try to take as as many precautions as they can, uh, and that we don't stop thinking about those that are in countries um, that are not as fortunate as ours. If we are struggling this much as one of the wealthiest countries in the world in providing. Uh, urgent and proper health care to, to people who need it, in providing financial relief to people who need it, in stabilizing our economy, uh, in delivering much-needed services to our most vulnerable. Can you imagine what countries um, that are that are uh, heavily populated but don't have any of those resources Congressman uh, Burr, might be dealing with? We have to go, but I wanted to ask your overall assessment of how President Trump has handled this from the egregious lack of tests that are available in this country that go to the core of public health strategies to find hotspots, to know how to deal with people, uh, to the issue of um, protective gear being available to the bravest in this country, the doctors, the nurses, the uh, people who are doing sanitation in hospitals being protected. Um, can you assess what President Trump has done? Yeah, and in the experts we trust in Donald Trump, we don't. It is really devastating to watch uh, how much he is downplaying this, this crisis, uh, how much he's driven really by his poll numbers and, and what, the, what is going to happen in the upcoming election. This is the time for bold leadership. This is the time to make sure that you are uh, protecting every single American, uh, when we think about war, uh, one of the first things that happens um, is that you are told to leave no one behind. And so we want this president, this administration, to stop fooling around, to stop downplaying this, this crisis, to really take this pandemic serious, to protect and the President American Trump people. And President Trump saying he's going to try to, to open the country up by Easter. Policy. President Trump saying he'll try to open the country up by Easter, when the doctors is, and the scientists— that, that is extremely irresponsible. Uh, and dangerous. We want to make sure that people are being protected. Uh, lives are much more important than this economy, regardless of what the president or some of the um, Republican talking heads might say. It is really quite devastating to see people have a conversation about what it looks like to prioritize anything other than preserving the lives and the livelihoods of the people we were elected to, to preserve. And so I uh, ask vigorously of every single American um, to have a conversation about the, the lack of leadership that is being shown uh, and the kind of danger that we are being put in uh, by a president who certainly doesn't know how to trust uh, scientists, is who uh, some have even asked if he knows what a ventilator is, uh, and someone who clearly doesn't have a clue what it means uh, to put country first. Congressmember Ilhan Omar, I want to thank you for being with us, representing the 5th Congressional District in Minnesota, uh, one of two Muslim women now uh, the first two Muslim women to serve in Congress and the first African refugee to serve there. When we come back, we speak with author Matt Stoller, who says the coronavirus relief bill could turn into a corporate coup if we aren't careful. Stay with us. Gracias al coronavirus, mi situación es grotesca. Por estar en cuarentena, creo que pierdo la cabeza. He limpiado cuartos y baños, sala, comedor, nevera, baño al perro, lavo el carro. Ya me arte de la limpieza, lavo ropa, yo cocino, friego y boto la basura. En mi casa yo estoy preso, que ya encuentren esa cura. Ay, sí, 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 qué aburrimiento profundo, que acabe la cuarentena. English, 
Let This Quarantine End by Emmanuel Perez, a parody of Colombian musician Carlos Vives's classic hit song, Fresh Fruit. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States, from New York City. As we continue our look at the massive $2 trillion coronavirus relief package, the largest stimulus bill in U.S. history, with a guest who argues the country will be unrecognizable after this pandemic if big corporations walk away with trillions of dollars and no strings attached. Joining us via video stream is Matt Stoller, as so many guests are representing um, are self-isolating in their homes to protect the larger community. Community and themselves. Matt Stoller, research director at the American Economic Liberties Project, author of the book Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. His column for The Guardian is headlined, The Coronavirus Relief Bill Could Turn Into a Corporate Coup If We Aren't Careful. So the House is clearly passing this unprecedented $2.2 trillion bill today. Matt, what are your concerns? Well, I mean, it's not really a $2 trillion bill. It's more like a 6 to $10 trillion bill. So one of the reasons you can tell that the bill is packed with corporate goodies is that, you know, Congress is debating and trying to figure out, oh, you know, is it $2 trillion, you know, a bunch of money for hospitals or, or money for cities? And meanwhile, a couple of days ago, Larry Kudlow is on a press conference and says, actually, this is a $6 trillion bill. It's like, how does a bill go from $2 trillion to $6 trillion without anyone really noticing? Um, and the answer is there's a bunch of stuff in there. And, you know, there are people on Wall Street chattering about how it's actually going to be $10 trillion because, you know, what's another four? Um, and, and that's how you know that the bill is just packed with stuff for, uh, for Wall Street, for large monopolists. And it's done through a variety of opaque slush funds, um, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC guarantees of bank debt. There's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, some of us who worked in the financial crisis noticed paid attention to, said, oh, that's where they're stealing all the money. Um, and so that there's a bunch of stuff in there uh, that's going to get to Boeing and airlines that we know about uh, has been reported. There's also a bunch of stuff that's going to get to the, you know, the hedge fund guys that are bunkering down in their, um, you know, in their underground wine caves or whatever. And meanwhile, the, the stuff that we need the, for normal people, the ventilators, the, um, uh, the, the unemployment, you know, that's going to dribble out, small business is going to dribble out. And so what you're going to see is, is the, the, you know, four to six to eight trillion dollars of, of basically no cost or low cost guaranteed credit is going to be used by Citibank, uh, JP Morgan, um, and then any big monopolist or large company that can get access to it to buy up their competitors uh, and buy up small business who are obviously now in a really distressed state because they don't have any revenue. So that's what's going to happen. Um, and I look forward to all of the progressives who are supporting this, like Congresswoman oh Ilhan Ohar, supporting a wealth tax uh, later on for all the wealth that they are right now transferring to Wall Street. That'll C be fun. CNBC's Jim Cramer said last Friday the economic downturn from the pandemic could leave the United States with just three retailers after the That's crisis right. ends. This is what he said. We come out of this uh, sooner than other small businesses can open. If we come out of this later, David, there's going to be three retailers in this country. There's going to be Amazon, there's going to be Walmart, and there's going to be Costco. Uh, and that is something that the government cannot afford to have happen. So, um, Matt Stoller, if you can respond to what Kramer said, while President Trump stands at the White House podium saying we're spending much more time concerned about small business than big business, he didn't say we're spending much more money concerned about small business than big business. I, I don't think that this is actually—I don't want to leave this on Trump. Honestly, this is the fault of the Democrats. This is the fault of Nancy Pelosi. It's the fault of members like Ilhan Omar, who just spoke about this, not paying attention to what's in the bill. Uh, it's the fault of Bernie Sanders. It's the fault of Elizabeth Warren. Um, these are the people that had leverage, that had the ability to make an argument about what this bill is. And instead of saying that this bill is a handout to corporate America and a roll-up of power, they decided to stay quiet, let Chuck Schumer organize the whole process and, um, you know, and do some moral grandstanding. And it's really embarrassing. And it's really a problem because they're lying to the progressive movement. They're lying to the Democratic Party. And, and so now we have no debate. Uh, about what is effectively probably a more significant bill than TARP in 2008. And all of this stuff that's happening, the, the handover of power to Wall Street, is happening under the really cynical guise of helping people in a pandemic. A lot of this money is going to go 
um, uh, to some of the money is going to go to hospitals. Some of the money is going to go to help people in the pandemic. So there's some good stuff here. That, of course, is going to dribble out on the rickety infrastructure of the Small Business Administration and, you know, unemployment insurance. Our government's been hollowed out, so this stuff isn't going to get out quickly, but um, quickly enough. But I, I think we really have to take some responsibility as Democrats, um, I'm a Democrat, uh, as progressives, as conservatives, as Republicans, you know, this is a total system failure. This is a handover of power to Wall Street. And in a month or two or three, people are going to get confused. They're going to say, wait a second, why isn't this working? What's happening? And like, this is the moment. The moment was, was this week when the House and Senate are voting on it. And you have a whole bunch of largely clueless, um, either stupid, corrupt, or, or cowardly members who won't actually look at what's in the bill, won't organize uh, won't think about it, won't debate. And so they've handed over, you know, I, I didn't think that Bernie Sanders was going to hand the country over to big business, but that is effectively what he did. I didn't think Elizabeth Warren was going to do that, but that is effectively what she You're did. You're attributing so think, a lot of power to them. Absolutely. The, the, the leverage point here was about the public debate. Last week, when Mitch McConnell was coming up with a bill, you know, and I wrote about Not this, but others wrote about it. Not including the Democrats in this. Well, yeah, but the Democrats didn't make an argument about what was in that bill. They said, oh, OK, uh, trillions of dollars for Wall Street. Sure, we'll call that pandemic relief. Instead of saying that's trillions of dollars for Wall Street, what we need is immediate pandemic relief. Instead, they, they, they conceded to Mitch McConnell and Steve Mnuchin that giving a trillion, two, three, four trillion dollars to Wall Street was pandemic relief. And that's just nonsense. And so in, in and even today, they're not saying that uh, what is in this bill. They don't even know that the bill is six trillion dollars versus $2 trillion. I mean, the whole thing is just embarrassing uh, and dishonest. Now, now, I could see them saying, yeah, you know, it is a $6 trillion bill. I mean, I'll, I'll also say, I, I have to, um, you know, we have to get money out to hospitals. We have to get money out to small business. We have to get out money out to, to, to ordinary people that are suffering right now. Um, it's a real, it, you have to do it. And, and it will happen. If the Democrats had gotten together and, and blocked this bill, then, you know, Mitch McConnell and, and Mnuchin and, and, and uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy and Trump would have had no choice but to accept well, let any me, deal. Let me play presidential candidate Bernie Sanders um, speaking Wednesday night about the unprecedented, well, more than $2 trillion emergency relief bill. I am very, very, very concerned about a $500 billion that will go out to the corporate world without, let me underline, without the accountability and transparency uh, that is needed. Uh, we do not need, uh, at this moment in history, to provide an, a massive amount of corporate welfare to large, profitable corporations. I think, as many of you are aware, uh, you have industry like the industries like the airlines industries, among others, uh, that have provided for stock buybacks, billions and billions of dollars for stock buybacks. They spent all their cash rewarding themselves and their stockholders. And lo and behold, today, they need a major bailout. So the concern here is, A, do we trust the Trump administration to effectively decide which company will get the loans or the grants? The answer is no, I do not. Uh, do we think that these loans and grants during a political season will be used to benefit the president's uh, election prospects? Absolutely, I do. So, Matt Stoller, that's Bernie Sanders. I also want to ask about the 0 percent interest loans, then buy bonds and stocks that yield 2 to 6 percent interest. Who gets to do this? So, so um, uh, you know, first of all, that $500 billion that Bernie was talking about, it's actually more like $4.5 uh, trillion, dollars. so just, a, just an FYI. Um, the— uh, yeah, if you have basically if you have an account at at a, a a large bank, if you're a wealthy investor like Goldman Sachs, there's a whole set of programs that you can get access to at the Federal Reserve. Um, at, at least this was the case in 2008, and the Fed says they're setting up similar structures where you can borrow from the Fed and you can gamble with it. And then if you lose, right, if you in your gambling, then the 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 Fed will you don't have to pay the loan back to the Fed. So. That's one of the, you know, and this is one of the programs they say, oh, we need to provide, you know, liquidity in the markets or various other really super boring things that sound like you kind of go to sleep when you're like, oh, all, all these alphabet soup programs and, and all this kind of jargon. But that's really what it is. It's just, you know, heads I win, tails you lose. And that's a lot of what these programs are. I mean, the Fed has already hired 
BlackRock, which is one of the world's largest asset managers, to manage this multi-trillion dollar bailout. And they've said that BlackRock is going to be allowed to participate in the bailout. So they're running the bailout and they're participating in the bailout. They're already stealing. Before the vote, the, the bill has, has even passed the House. I mean, this is just like, for, most of, for a lot of us who worked in the financial crisis, this is just embarrassing. It's a bad joke to watch it go through with like literally no opposition from anyone in power. Um, and I'm sorry, but Bernie Sanders getting up and grandstanding about uh, an unemployment provision that he didn't negotiate that was going to die anyway, that's embarrassing and it's dishonest and he shouldn't lie to his supporters like that. Well, Matt Stoller, uh, we're going to do a post show with you and uh, continue the discussion, particularly look at something that no one is paying attention to in the coronavirus pandemic, and that is the issue of uh, decision around uh, the Supreme Court making around Comcast and racial sure. discrimination. Uh, you've written a lot about this, um, but we'll do that and post it at democracynow.org. Matt Stoller, research director at American Economic Liberties Project, author of the book Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly, Power and Democracy. When we come back, we'll look at what sheltering in place means when you're forced to stay with your abuser. Stay with us. <laughs> Andrew David singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah to the empty streets of Chicago in a video shared on social media. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, broadcasting from New York City, now the center of the pandemic in the United States. Shelter in place? What happens when you're trapped at home with your abuser? We turn now to look at the domestic violence during the pandemic. As schools shut, public spaces close, all but essential workers are ordered to stay indoors. Domestic violence services are scrambling to help vulnerable people navigate home lines, they say, are increasingly unsafe during the pandemic. More than one in three women in the U.S. has experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner, according to a 2010 survey. In 2018, more than half the violent crimes in the U.S. were domestic violence cases. We end with Katie Ray Jones, chief executive officer of the National Domestic Violence Hotline and Love is Respect. She's joining us from Austin, Texas. Thanks so much for being with us, Katie Ray Jones. Talk about what you're experiencing now on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. What are your greatest concerns during this pandemic, where so many are shut in, are locked down in their homes around the country? Yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you're speaking very much to the crux of what we're most concerned with right now. We know that many victims and survivors of domestic violence are currently sheltering in place with their abusive partner. And we have started to hear from many survivors who are explaining to us about how COVID-19 is impacting their relationship, how abuse is beginning to escalate in the home, or how they're being further isolated from their social networks, their social support systems, employment, financial impact. It's quite a scary situation for many women across the country. So what are you hearing? What do you tell people? Um, what can you suggest to those who are terrified at home right now? We say the word shelter in place. It's hardly a shelter. Yeah, I mean, you make a really great point. This is really a dire situation for a lot of victims across the country. What we've been hearing is that we have had situations where 
the survivor is trying to leave, but shelters are currently not doing uh, intakes or they're full. Uh, they cannot go to their family members or their friends' houses in fear of exposure. Certainly if their parents are elderly, they're not wanting to go and, and take their children over there. Um, we're really hearing a lot of scary stories about how uh, one woman was being prevented to go to work. She wasn't in a community where there was a shelter in place, um, and her partner brought out a firearm and began to load the firearm as a method to keep her in the home. And she said that had never happened before. This was the first time she'd seen something like this escalate. We've also heard from women who ended up calling 911 um, and that when the police came out, they said that these were low violent crimes and they weren't in a position to detain the abusive partner. And so that's a scary situation for a lot of survivors. What we're really hoping to do right now, recognizing that it is going to be very difficult for a survivor to call a hotline when their perpetrator is sitting right next to them, or to be able to enter into an online chat with an advocate when their abusive partner's watching what they're doing. There could be serious consequences for a survivor in those situations. So we're imploring friends, family, neighbors to contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline on behalf of someone else, because you may be their only lifeline to education, safety information, while we're working through situations where people can't flee the home. And what's happening to emergency shelters right now for uh, domestic violence victims? I think we're seeing an array of different strategies being used, which I think it makes it really difficult for survivors to know what their options are. Um, one, we're hearing some shelters are still operating and putting in a lot of procedures to keep their current residents safe and healthy. Um, some are using motels and hotels to be able to place people in emergency situations. But we know many nonprofits on a good day are under-resourced and don't have a lot of financial resources to leverage hotels and motels for those expenses. Some are not doing intakes right now in order to keep their current residents healthy, safe, and some are just at capacity. So what we're doing is as survivors are calling us, we're working with those local communities to try to place them. Uh, we had a pastor who called us yesterday trying to get shelter for a victim, and it looked in two different states um, and wasn't being successful in finding a, a location for that individual. So we know that these are really dire. So unfortunately, uh, we're doing a lot of safety planning in place strategies. Um, we're talking with survivors about if, an, if a fight breaks out, a violent incident breaks out in the home, where's the safest place to move in the home? Can you take time for yourself, uh, whether it's a shower, uh, journaling, taking just a quiet moment to be able to gather your strength, recognizing that you are courageous, you're strong, you're brave, you're surviving every day. But there's not a lot of resources out there right now, Amy, for people to actually get connected to. I want to thank you so much, Katie Ray Jones, for being with us, Chief Executive Officer of the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and the number of that hotline. 1-800-799-7233, or you can chat at thehotline.org. We want to thank you so much. Uh, thank and you. this word of advice in protecting the whole community. Um, it is so critical that in order not to wash our hands of all of this, we simply wash our hands. When you see somebody and you're afraid to step away because you don't want them to feel like you're afraid of them, don't think of them as the vector of disease. Think of yourself as possibly one who could infect others, because we can't know at this point. Step away. Be at a safe distance to make the whole community safe. And when you wash your hands to understand why this is so important, is just simple water and soap. I know for many, it is not even possible to get that water. But if you have access and soap, soap is critical. It is the most important weapon, because the coronavirus, corona is the crown on the virus, which is a lipid, and the soap cuts through that. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. You know how you see doctors on TV shows washing their hands and then putting their arms up? This is the way to do it. You'd sing happy birthday twice if you want to. But you've got to scrub those hands. You've got to interlace your fingers and scrub. Scrub your fingertips, you know, that touches, oh, everything from buttons to elevator buttons, everything else. Wash the back and the front of your hands. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your family. You're doing it for the whole community to stop community spread. We have to keep each other safe in this very dire time.
of this pandemic. That does it for the show. I want to thank the amazing team that makes Democracy Now! happen every day. So many of us working from home in isolation to protect everyone else and the team that comes in to do this broadcast. And also a belated birthday. Happy wishes to Miriam Barnard. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guster, Nermeen Sheikh, uh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alcoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen. Special thanks to Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman. Thank you so much.